too long on my own I wasn't created to bear it alone I hear your invitation to let it all go I see it now Laying it down, I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I turn with the hiding, the reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again. Good morning, South Bay Bible Church. Welcome to South Bay Bible Church Online. Uh, oddly enough, I know many of us were able to attend, you know, praise the Lord that we were able to attend in person. But to me, 
it's been so long that we've been doing this online that it's almost like oddly like comforting for me as a a, a preacher to be preaching online to myself. I I, I was stand. I I can tell you from my my experience now. Uh, last Sunday when we were gathering in person, it was amazing. I love worshiping with all of you, but preaching felt really weird. I can't lie; it felt it's really strange. Like, whoa, there's people and they're looking at me, and I'm preaching and I'm talking, and there's people in the room. And it's the way it should be, but it felt really weird. And oddly enough, me talking to this computer right now feels like comfortable. <laughs> and I hope that I I can get back out of it. But I'm telling you, it's going to take some time. And uh, I hope that we should all show each other grace um, with getting back to the way things used to be. I hope we all continue to stay safe and, and just be thankful for every single day and every relationship that we're able to rekindle. Um, so with that, we're going to continue in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2. All the way to chapter four, who do you hold in esteem? Who are the people that you respect? Um, there are so many people that I respect. I actually, I have, res- I have so many respect. I can just list people in, in terms of ministry that I respect. You know, my dad, um, in terms of him, uh, just seeing the way that he lives his life uh, and the way that people just have been so blessed by his ministry. I definitely hold my, my own father in esteem. I hold, I hold uh, Pastor Chris in, in great esteem as well. Um, I'm sure many of you as well hold him in esteem. I, there's so many reasons why we hold people in esteem, right? They could they could be great um, speakers. They could be prayer warriors. They could be really financially savvy. They could be, you know, they could, you know, be really athletic or whatever is really good looking, whatever it could be. There's many reasons why we hold people in esteem. And so that, just try to think of maybe one or two people, one or two people that um, you you respect, that you hold in esteem, that, that you're like, wow, this person's impressive. It could be your boss. <laughs> Maybe you don't like your boss. Maybe it's a coworker that's really hardworking. Maybe it's your own parent or your own sibling or your neighbor, someone else close to you. Or it could be someone afar too. Like I've, I've heard stories about this person and I respect the, the works and the things that I've read about them. Um, who do you hold in esteem? Uh, as, we, as you think about that, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. Let's pray. God, I thank you. Thank you so much for the time that you've given us, especially last week, God. It was so good to see those of us who are able to attend in person. And God, uh, it's just a it's just a blessing, God, the way that you have you went, you know, way ahead of us, preparing the way, making that sure that everything was going to be great and uh, for us to worship you, God. And so all the glory goes to you. All the honor goes to you. And God, we are just privileged to be a part of your family. And so God, right now, as we open up your word, I pray for um, just clarity that we would be able to hear and and read and understand your word fully. Um, I pray for your spirit to just illuminate the text to us, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So quick recap of Isaiah chapter one and chapter two. Um, There's a picture of a hut in a cucumber field, my favorite image, which I really, (laughs) it's really stuck with me from Isaiah one. Um, and then chapter two, the uh, where we left off last week, here's what it, uh, in chapter two, verse two, it says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains and it will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. It's just an amazing, hopeful picture of what the end times will bring. All people streaming to God's presence, learning from the Lord and people just talking and testifying to one another. And it ends with this hopeful cry, come. Come, let's walk in the light of the Lord together. And let's see where Isaiah goes from there. Isaiah goes from there right after that. You, Lord, have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. Okay. Okay, Isaiah. This is the next verse, okay? You, Lord, have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. This brings up a lot of questions. And Isaiah is not meant to be read just verse by verse. It's meant to be read in context. So we're going to keep reading and we'll see what this actually means. You, Lord, have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. So Isaiah, the prophet, is speaking here. You, Lord, he's addressing God. You, Lord, have abandoned your people, the descendants of Jacob. So he's talking to the nation of Judah here. Verse 6. They are full of superstitions from the east. Who is they? Judah. They practice divinations like the Philistines and embrace pagan customs. Their land. Whose land? Judah's land is full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There's no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So 
Isaiah is calling out the current state of Judah, which we kind of remember from chapter one, full of rebellion, full of empty ritualistic worship. But more than that, we see a broader, more specific picture of what Isaiah is calling people out. Number one, the people of Judah do not live like the priest, the kingdom of priests that God has called them to be. Instead, they live like every other nation. They're full of superstitions from the East. The East is not like China or Asia. The East is just like the the East, the East, Eastern countries, nations from Israel. So like think of uh, Syria, think of Iran, think of Iraq. Those are the areas, Assyria, Babylon. Those are the places in ancient uh, the ancient world that they're talking about. They practice divination like the Philistines. The Philistines is where? On the coast, the Gaza Strip. That's the West. So from the East to the West, they are being influenced by all of these other nations. Furthermore, their land is full of silver and gold. So they are wealthy, but also their land is full of horses. There's no end to their chairs. What does that mean? Do they really like horses? They have a lot of pets? No. Horses and chairs, you guys probably know this, they are instruments of military might. So they are they are not only wealthy, they are powerful. At this time, there was peace in the land. There was peace in Judah, and they were able to grow economically and grow militarily. But as they grew comfortable and wealthy and powerful, we see also their worship died. They became full and live like every other nation. They, be, they possessed great wealth and power, but they ended up worshiping idols, worshiping idols that they have made by their own hand. They, it's basically like the creator worshiping things that they created. They no longer worship the Lord. It's, this is what Isaiah is painting a picture of. And so what happens? So what, is, what does Isaiah say? The people will be brought low. Everyone humbled. Do not forgive them. Do not forgive them. So what is going to be exalted? We just read it in the beginning of chapter 2. What is going to be lifted high on the last day? It's the mountain of the temple of the Lord, right? That will be exalted. Only God, the Lord, the Holy One of Israel will be exalted, left standing when it's all said and done. Everyone else, everyone else who rejected the Lord, who worshipped other things, who sought to, to live for other things will be brought low. And this is the word of the prophet. Do not forgive them. Um, this reminds me of, of the testimony that Pastor Brian Takawa shared with us of Rachel Dahlhander, who was instrumental in exposing the abuse of Larry Nasser uh, against the gymnastics program in, in the U.S. Um, and she made a great point. Like, I do not see that you are repentant, so I will not forgive you until I see that. And I think that's the heart that Isaiah has as a prophet over his people. I will not, I will not pray for the forgiveness of uh, the Lord upon my people when I don't see evidence that they are repentant. And so what he says is the people will be brought low and humbled. And I don't want you, God, to forgive them. Amazing. It's, it's, it's this terrible state that, that Isaiah sees and calls out in the people of Judah. And, you know, we kind of understand that sometimes we ourselves, we get so lost that the only way we learn, the only way we learn is for everything to fall apart, right? So people would be brought low and everyone humbled. Do not forgive them. Let's keep going. Now, we'll see that. Uh, we're going to go into this next section where Isaiah is speaking to the people now. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogance will be humbled. Human pride brought low. You see the theme now of human arrogance and pride being brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. We're going to see this theme. Human arrogance, pride is called out. And that will be the, 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 the recipient of God's judgment. And why? Because the Lord alone is worthy of being exalted, of being worshipped. All right. And so Isaiah is, is speaking and prophesying over these people about this day of judgment that's coming. And he's saying, run for the hills. Run for the hills. If you are, if you are living in rebellion to the Lord, you need to run for the hills when he comes in judgment. The day will come. For those who have made themselves their own God, essentially, that they will come under the judgment of the one true God. And that's what this day will look like. And Isaiah is now going to paint a picture of, uh, or, or just kind of describe things that are high and lofty, comparing that to the human pride and arrogance. And we're going to see that Isaiah is not just like, uh, like a sermon. It's not just like me talking, but it's like me, if I were to like write a 
like Shakespearean poetry. Um, there's a lot of like rhythmic and repetitive things going on here, word plays. Um, it's, it's kind of mind blowing how like great of a, a, a piece of literature this is um, in terms of the message that he's able to convey, the, the images that he's able to produce and just the overall like poetry of all of this. It's a, a poetry of judgment, but it's still poetry nonetheless. So we're gonna see this in, in um, chapter, tw uh, chapter two onward. Um, verse 12, the Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and all the high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every stately vessel. So what is Isaiah doing? He's just pointing up things that are they're high and lofty. They're, nothing is, nothing um, is going to escape the judgment of the Lord. And, and, and of course, this is a picture of one of the cedars of Lebanon. It's, it's kind of amazing. I, I, I had no idea. I always read through the, the scriptures and what is the cedar of Lebanon? Even like, this is what it looks like. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, but this, this image is, is, a, is what Isaiah is like throwing out, um, like just comparisons. Our human, the human pride and arrogance is like, is like these cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty. You see these things? They will be brought low. The arrogance of man will be brought low. Human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And the idols will totally disappear. It feels like I just read this, right? And I just did. Verse 10, verse 11, and verse 17, 18, they're repetitive, right? This is poetry. This is prophetic, but it's also poetry. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord in the splendor of his majesty. And then it repeats this phrase, right? The eyes of the arrogant will be humbled and human pride brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in the day, in verse 18, and the idols will totally disappear, right? All the idols will disappear next to Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. When he comes in judgment, all of those idols will disappear. So those who are arrogant, those who are prideful, those who have sought to make themselves great outside of the uh, outside of covenant of the Lord, they will also disappear. The idols will disappear and those who worship idols will disappear. The, the ones worshiping the idols will go hide in the ground and in the rocks when the Lord comes in the fearful presence of the Lord, the splendor of his majesty. Uh, I kind of, you know, the worship leader in me, at least the, the modern worship leader in me, when I read through this, actually what I thought of was not like the apocalypse, but the presence of the Lord and the, the splendor of his majesty it made me think of the song, how great is our God? Anyone, if, if you're like me and you, you love that song, you sang it for many years, you, you might have also thought of the splendor of, of, of his majesty, right? The splendor of the king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. That, <laughs> reading through this gives kind of a new wrinkle and meaning to those words when we sing it now, right? It's like the splendor of the king will humble all of those people and <laughs> human pride will draw those. It's like, you see where Chris Tomlin kind of took some stuff and, and left out some of the other stuff here. But anyways, we'll keep going. Uh, we'll see more of the poetic um, structure of this chapter here. Verse 19 all the way to 21. People will flee to caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground. We heard that already. Go, go over there. This is Isaiah continuing to talk about the day of the Lord that's coming for those who have lived in rebellion. People will flee to caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord, the splendor of his majesty. And when he rises to shake the earth, in that day, people will throw away to the moles and bats their idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made to worship. All idols will disappear, right? It's a rep repetition and building and, and deepening of this picture. 21, they will flee to caverns in the rocks. We just read this. To the overhanging crags from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. So we see here, and the way that the Hebrew um, poetry is structured, um, oftentimes it's called a chiasm and all that means is just two beginning and ends and there's a, a juicy middle, right? The juicy middle is what we always want to look at. And so we see there's a repetition in 19 and 21. And the juicy middle I boxed for you in 20. In that day, so we look here, this is the emphasis of this poem. In that day, people will throw away what? To the moles and bats. Moles and bats is basically like the vermin of that day, the unclean, the things that, um, well, I mean bats. There's a little bit of controversy about bats in the past year, haven't there? Uh, the moles and the bats, the things that are unclean, the things that are dirty, the things that are worthless, they will throw 
their idols of silver and idols of gold to things that are vermin, which were they made to worship. That's a crazy picture, right? When God comes in judgment, the things that you used to worship, you're going to see as completely worthless. You're going to throw it away to the trash, to worse than the trash, to the moles and the bats, the moles and the bats. The moles is like rats, right? So the rats and the bats, it rhymes better in English. Um, so people will flee to caves and rocks from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. Um, and so when the time comes, when the time comes, nothing's going to save the people that have lived in rebellion. Those idols that they prayed to, the idols that they worship will not save. Um, the presence of the Lord and, and God coming in judgment and he shakes everything and breaks everything down. When everything falls apart, those idols will, will be worthless. All idols will disappear. And so we get to the main point of this whole poem. Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? I think uh, this really struck me as I was meditating on this chapter. It's not just the fact that, you know, it's a good poem. It's really well written and made me really picture all these crazy things, but this is a truth for us today. Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? We keep going here. Chapter three, verse one. See now the Lord, the Lord Almighty is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah, both supply and support, all supplies of food and all supplies of water, the hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the men of rank, the counselor, skilled craftsman and clever enchanter, I will make mere use their officials. Children will rule over them. So it doesn't get any better for the people of the Lord. Not only will um, the day of the Lord come for those who have lived in rebellion, but Isaiah is now talking more specifically about Judah and Jerusalem. And this is a prophetic, ju a prophetic judgment. Why are the people being judged? Because of what we just read. Because they've rejected the Lord. They have lived like other nations. They have sought wealth and power. And they have worshipped idols. And they, they have held humans in esteem instead of the Lord. And so now because of all of that, the people have, have rejected God and the Lord has come and is coming in judgment. And um, what does the Lord's judgment look like? It's not just people running for the hills, but if we read this carefully, it's the Lord taking away supply and support from the city of Jerusalem. And what does it look like when all supplies and food um, are taken away? It looks like the city is under siege where no, nothing's able to come in or out. But also, not only are the supplies of food and water being taken away, but all the leaders, the hero, the warrior, the judge, prophet, all the people who have rank in the city are, have, have been taken away. That looks like what? Exile. So siege and exile, Isaiah is prophesying, is coming for the people of Jerusalem. So it's not just pure you know, earthquake destruction, uh, but it's siege. No food, no water. It's exile. All the, all the people of rank, all the leaders will be exiled. And we see that Isaiah tr is a true prophet, that, that later on there's another empire that comes, the Babylonians that come, and they exile. They, they, they exile Jerusalem, the, the people of Judah, um, and they, they, get, they get taken out of the promised land. Isaiah, judgment, his prophecy is true, is true. Verse 5, people will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old and know but that nobody against the honored. A man will seize the one of his brothers in his father's house and say, you have a cloak, be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. But in that day, he will cry out, I have no remedy. I have no food or clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. So not only will no, there will be no leaders left, they'll just be scrape, scraping around, trying to find anyone to lead this ragtag nation, this heap of ruins. That's what's going to be left. It looks like the end result of warfare, the end result of exile. We'll keep going. Jerusalem staggers. Judah is falling. Their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. The look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked. Disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. Youths oppress my people. Women rule over them. My people, your guides lead you astray. They turn you from the path. They turn you from the path. 
So there will be no one left because of the exile to lead and guide the people. Um, so now Isaiah sets up a contrast. So the people that have lived in rebellion, they will face judgment, um, who are uh, bringing disaster upon themselves, living in sin, parading and, and flaunting the sin in the face of the Lord. They're choosing rebellion. They're choosing allegiance to their own desires and other nations and idols. They are basically, Isaiah is saying, they're choosing the judgment of God. They're bringing disaster upon themselves. But there's a contrast here. For the righteous, it will be well with them. It's going to be okay. For those who live rightly, they will enjoy the fruit of the deeds. But those who live wickedly, they will they will reap the benefit, uh, the reap the disaster that is coming upon them. Not the benefit, sorry, misspoke there. They will they will reap the disaster that is coming. So there's this causal relationship that Isaiah draws between rebellion and judgment. But there's also this you know, other causal relationship between living righteously and wellness. And for those of you who think that, you know, yeah, I'm going to try my best to live righteously, just a hint for you. Every one of us falls under this category of rebellion. That's why we need Jesus, right? That's the doctrine doctrine of grace. Um, so we have all lived in rebellion, but, you know, we know, we understand that God has established boundaries. He created this world, the world that we live in, to... Uh, for us to live and to thrive, um, we have to live under God's set of parameters, the way that he created this world um, that is laid out in the law, the instruction, the Torah. Um, so there's cause and effect. There's this, you know, compare and contrast between uh, those who rebel and those who live rightly. Um, and those, and those who live lives of righteousness will enjoy the blessing. Um, and so, we see verse 12, youths oppress my people, women rule over them. My people, your guides lead you astray. They turn you from the past. So Isaiah is now shifting and talking more and dressing the leaders of Israel. The Lord, this is Isaiah talking, the Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment against who? The elders and leaders of his people. It is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. And here we see the prophet being the spokesperson of the Lord directly. This is the accusation of the Lord against the leaders and elders of the people of Judah. This is what the Lord has on them as evidence. Who's on trial here? The leaders, right? And, you know, this is... This is expected. You know, this is like a universal principle that leaders should be held to a higher standard. The leaders have, the leaders of God's people have ruined the Lord's vineyard. What does that mean? The, the vineyard represents the people, the people, the nation of Israel. But more specifically, how have they ruined the people? How have they ruined the nation? The plunder from the poor is in your houses. You just picture this image. They have plundered from the poor, those who have less, who have nothing. They've taken what little the poor have and saved it into their own houses, taking it to enrich themselves. How terrible what we see this picture of corruption and injustice. And this, this is a crazy, crazy phrase. Uh, it's, what do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, declares the Lord the Lord Almighty. What do you mean when you live like this? What do you mean when you treat others like this? What do you mean when you take advantage of those who have less? What do you mean by crushing my people, grinding the faces of the poor? You are breaking the covenant. You are living like you are the Lord. And so this is the accusation. This is the evidence that the Lord has on the leaders of Israel, that they have been corrupt, that they have driven the poor into even more poverty. And the Lord, you know, he, he, this is why the judgment is coming. This is why the judgment is coming. So hold that in mind. Shift gears, 16. The Lord says, the women of Zion are high, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Therefore, the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion, the Lord will make their scalps bald. So what, I mean, you can read this and be like, what does the Lord have against women? Um, we have to keep reading because this is, uh, the women of Zion is, is basically, uh, Isaiah is painting another picture of uh, the whole people, the whole city of Zion and describing the city of Zion like this 
proud woman that be walking the streets uh, with, adorned with all this type of jewelry, right? Verse 18, in that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery, the bangles and the headbands and the crescent necklaces, the earrings and bracelets and veils, the headdresses and the anklets and sashes, keeps going, the perfume bottles and charms, the signet rings and nose rings, the fine robes and the capes and the cloaks and purses and mirrors and the linen garments and tiaras and shawls. It's excess, it's exhaustive list of things that someone would want to adorn themselves with. Yeah, it's, it seems like this is going real deep against women. Um, but I don't think that's what's happening, really. If we keep reading, we'll see that Isaiah is, is really just personifying um, Jerusalem as this super luxuriously, um, uh, outlandishly luxurious, you know, excessive lifestyle that this woman might have. Um, and so... In that day, the Lord will snatch away all of these things that have been adorned. And instead of fragrance, there'll be a stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. Your men will fall by the sword. Your warriors in battle. The gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute, she will sit on the ground. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, we will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. So what we see here is there's a little bit of, of poetry here, a little bit of prophecy. It's our job to figure this out, right? It's, it's, we have to think about this um, and, and try to understand this together. Is, is God anti-women? No. God loves and created women in the image of God, right? And so uh this verse 26 says that the gates of zion will lament and mourn right do gates lament and mourn no the gates of zion will lament and mourn meaning the people of zion will lament and mourn destitute she will sit on the ground the gates are now a she we have to just read this properly right it's not anti women this is just a picture that isaiah is painting trying to describe uh the pride and the excess of jerusalem as this fully adorned, luxurious woman walking around. Um, so instead of, of it's, instead of fragrance, there'll be a stench. Instead of spraying like perfume, you're gonna have the odor of death. Instead of a sash, rope, rope binding people. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness from, from disease. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth for mourning. Instead of beauty, branding for being enslaved. You men will fall by the sword. There's war coming. There is a battle coming that you will lose. There will be lament and mourning. And in that day, seven women will take hold of one man, meaning that all your men will die. All your men will be exiled. And there's no one left in the city. That is the death and the exile that, that Isaiah is prophesying over the people because of their rebellion. This is the judgment that Isaiah prophesies about. This And this will come to pass. It does come to pass when the people continue in their own rebellion and their wickedness. So what? We we finished Isaiah chapter 2, verse uh, 4, verse 1. I hope you're encouraged by all of this. No. no. So what? When we read these passages, we have to ask ourselves, so what? What does this mean? So lessons from Isaiah chapter 2 all the way to chapter 4. Remember the question I asked at the beginning. Why do we hold people in esteem? Why hold them in esteem? That's directly from Isaiah chapter 2. Why hold people in esteem? Why do we hold mere humans in esteem when their breath, they have split a single breath in their nostril, right? But it's so easy to hold people in esteem, isn't it? You know, we hold people in esteem because there are really impressive people out there. And um, I'm wearing this, I'm wearing like a warrior shirt. This is me holding someone in esteem. When I wear this, this is me holding someone in esteem. And what do they do? What does this person do? They dribble a ball and they shoot a ball into a hoop. And I wear their stuff. <laughs> That's, this is silly. it's crazy. We, there's so many really weird ways that we hold people in esteem. Um, athletic achievement, right? Steph Curry, he's amazing. We hold him in esteem. But there's also artistic achievement. When someone paints or sings really well or, or composes a, a, or directs a wonderful movie, um, we hold them in esteem. We give them Emmys and Oscars and Grammys and awards. Um, but I think more so in the Bay Area, we, we hold people for in esteem for their financial achievement, for achieving like billionaire status, for companies reaching unicorn levels. Um, we also hold people in esteem for scientific achievement, right? Think of like, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, &J, um, for their vaccine development. Um, 
think of like the human achievement, the scientific, the scientific achievement that is. We were like, wow, this is great. Um, but also like patriotism and and uh, you know national achievement, the Olympics coming up. We're like, yes, the USA. We had the most gold medals. We're gonna get it. We're gonna be the number one country in the world. We hold these things in esteem that we you, you take a step back. You're like, these are just people. What are we doing? What are we doing with all this? You know, there's a, but there's, you know, I'm wearing this for a reason. I bought this with my own money. This is me holding people in esteem. There's a lot of really compelling reasons. This is probably one of the least, one of the, a lot of really compelling reasons why we hold other humans in esteem. We think of, you know, personal and relational achievement. I think of like the great Mother Teresa, the, the way that she lives, the, people, the way that people live their lives causes us to hold them in esteem, right? The way that they self-sacrifice, even the way that they, um, in the church world, the way that they live on mission and sacrificially, it's like, whoa, look at the way that they pray. Look at the way that they live. I hold them in esteem, right? But even the most faithful person, the most faithful person is not worthy of our esteem the way that God is. Why? Because death will come for everyone. Death is going to come for Steph Curry. Death is going to come for, for Elon Musk. Death is going to come for you and me. Mortality is our reality. You know, uh, this past year, no one could escape this reality. Even those in elementary school, middle school, high school, when we were supposed to be feeling like, you know, you have your entire life ahead of you. I remember being young and dumb, thinking like, wow, I, I can do anything, right? I wasn't thinking about death. I wasn't thinking about, you know, legacy or thinking about, you know, the end, how things were going to end. But this past year, everyone had to come to face with this reality that we are mortal, that we are but a breath, right? Our human bodies have limitations. Our human advancements have limitations. Um, you know, uh, just the news this past week of the space race for the billionaires, you know, Elon and Bezos and Branson, uh, they successfully did it, right? Branson got up into space and someone paid $28 million for one ticket into space. But guess what? $28 million on earth, it's not going to get you into heaven. You can't buy your ticket into heaven. But mortality is still your reality. All right? So why hold people in esteem? That's what Isaiah is saying here. Why hold these people in esteem when they meet the same end that you will meet, that we all meet? We are all mortal. So why hold them in esteem? Why worship them the way that God is required to be worshipped? So, we need to watch that we don't look to mortal leaders when we should be looking to the almighty Lord. And this past year, past few years, we've seen the purge of a lot of successful and famous and influential church leaders. And many years ago, we, we saw the purge of uh, an expose, 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 oh man, expose, expose. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Um, God exposing the Catholic Church um, for their sexual abuse scandals and cover-ups. And now that has actually gone into the Protestant Church, the Evangelical Church, the Southern Baptist Convention as well. And we see that, you know, no matter how successful a church is, how large a church gets, um, you know, when they, when it doesn't matter. I mean, I can give a list of all these pastors. I don't want to do that because I don't want to defame them anymore. But um, when we, as the church, idolize strong people, whether they're leaders gifted with gravita or, or charisma or just leadership, um, we need to watch that we don't look to those leaders when we should actually be looking to the almighty Lord, that we are not holding them in, in, a, in a place of esteem that they are not worthy of in a way that no human is worthy of except the Lord. So, you know, I have to just say that I'm I'm here as a pastor by the grace of God. You know, our church is small, but it's small by the grace of God. And I, I just, you know, my my I'm just convinced of this. My job is to just point all of us to the Lord. And if you look at me and you hold me in esteem, um, for whatever reason, I can't think of any, but right now, but um, you you look at me, I I just want to be that that thing that points you back to the Lord. So we need to watch at church. We need to watch that we don't look to mortal leaders and we should be looking to the Lord. And the last thing is watch that we don't become consumed by earthly wealth. Thinking about that 
a picture of that woman dressed in all this excess. So we can't be consumed and weighed down by earthly wealth. It's, it's, it's hard to talk about here in the Bay Area, honestly. Just with the housing prices and the tech industry the way it is. Uh, and this is really near to me because you see right here, I'm in a new house, right? Liz and I just bought and sold and remodeled a house and it's the most money that I've ever spent in my entire life. You know, so what does this mean? It, am I sinning by living in this house? Are you sinning by working in tech? I, I don't think so. I think God has called all of us here for a very specific reason. So what does this mean? That means that even if we have been given a lot of wealth and you, you have been, you've been given so much, it means that you cannot live self-indulgent, excessive lives. We have to seek the Lord. And we seek the Lord, that means we also seek righteousness and justice. And I mentioned that space race earlier with the billionaires. And that is universally, pun intended, condemned by most ethicists and editorialists. That, and that is easy to say. You know, we point the finger and say, look at these billionaires who are wasting their money going into space when they could be solving all these other problems here on Earth. Right? They're so wasteful and they're hoarding and, and they have so much wealth. They should do something about it. But when we point the finger, that misses the point of what the scripture and the, the point of this whole message. Yes, you know, leaderships, those in power, they should be held to a higher standard. That's a universal principle. But if we don't look inward, we don't look at what we have in our own lives, then we've missed the point entirely. Maybe we don't have the resources to solve all homelessness in the Bay Area or to solve the income inequality that's here in the South Bay and the Bay Area. We can't, we can't solve the housing shortage or even address racism in a way that is, is um, acceptable to both sides. Well, I don't even know what both sides mean, but we can say, you know, but we have to say no to living self-indulgent lives. We have to just do our best to follow the Lord, do our best to read the scriptures and do what is right. Do our best to obey the Lord, to seek God and worship him alone. Not just in empty ritual and empty traditions, meaning that you go to church, check it off and think that you can live just like everyone else. No, you, you take the word in and do your part to obey the Lord, to live in a just and right society. So maybe that means voting a certain way. Maybe it means advocating for a certain thing but you read the scriptures and obey it. And, you know, there are many ways. Maybe we don't need all of this stuff here. I certainly don't need all these toys here. We don't need all these material things in our lives, right? Maybe we don't need to climb the corporate ladder. Maybe we can just live at peace, live shalom, satisfied in the Lord, living as agents of God's grace and God's justice. And I think that's the main lesson for us. Why do we hold these things in esteem, whether it's people or values of earth, the way that earth, the earthly values, the worldly cultures calls us to, to, to hoard and, and, and climb and climb and climb and, and try to get higher and higher and higher. But what does the Lord say? We are all mortal. Why hold these mere humans in esteem? Worship the Lord only. Don't be consumed by earthly wealth. Don't look to other people when you should be looking to the Lord. So with that, I want us to think about who do we hold in esteem? Who do you hold in esteem? Let's pray. God, I thank you. And we hold you in esteem today. We worship you and you alone, God, the Holy One of Israel, who created heaven and earth and yet makes a way for us to enter into a relationship with you through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And so God, we thank you that you did not send judgment, but you sent your son to die on a cross for us. You placed the, the consequence of sin onto him so that we might live, so that we could be called righteous and reap the benefit of that righteousness that Jesus has given to us. And so God, we thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ.
Heavenly Father, Lord, I just declare a word of victory and freedom over all of us here. Father, that the grave is indeed empty, Lord, that Christ is indeed risen, Lord, and because we have the reassurance that you are risen, Lord, that we can go into our lives knowing that, Lord, you are behind us. So God, give us just the strength to get through this week, Lord. Give us just the freedom to live in the victory that you won us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.